Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Good afternoon, members of AOI of DC and friends and guests. I'm sorry, everybody's having such a good time. I'm sorry to break, break into it, but we do have a program today, uh, and a very good one, and I want to uh, make sure that we get you all home before dark, or whatever. So, I'd like to welcome everybody here today, and uh, I think, as is frequently our custom, uh, do we have, like to, do we have any guests who are here today? hopefully prospective members. T stand up and tell us who you are. They've, they've tried to get me to come, and this is my first time. My friend Andre Andrea Seeger is a longtime friend, and um, she told me she just joined, so I'm happy to be here. And we are very happy to have you. Thank you. Any other guests? Well, I'm a military historian, so I would be, and I used to play at Fort Stevens when I was a little girl, so I'm very interested well, in Well, thank you for joining us today. Now, we also, um, also like to, um, oh, another guest. Oh, well, stand up and be counted. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is David Berg. And uh, I recently moved to D.C. from California. However, uh, my family on my father's side uh, lived in here, for, lived here for about 30, 40 years, starting back in the in the 20s. So I uh, have a long family history here. Uh, as part of getting to know the community, uh, I thought this would be a great organization to connect with, and that's why I'm here. Well, thank Pleasure. you. Thank you for joining us today. And, and while I've got the mic, so I know that Cin Cindy Hi. Gwelly, our vice president, is at home managing all the Zoom stuff, but her father-in-law, George Farr, is here. Okay, and I, I just took the time to introduce you rather than... Was that good? Thank you very much, and it's very good to be here. This is my first meeting. I'm, I'm delighted. Thank you. Now, now we'd, uh, thank you. We uh, have a new member, actually, today, I believe. Okay. New member or candidate? My name's Bill McElrath. I was invited here by Katie Meskel, uh, and uh, I'm a lifelong resident of the District of Columbia, and uh, thank you very much for uh, having us here. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Bill. My name is Vicki Crawford. I'm a fifth generation Washingtonian, never lived in the city, uh, always a Marylander. And I have two guests today, Lana Parvizian and Kathy Beesman. We're happy to have you both here. Thank you. And at our back table, every May, Bill Peterson from the University of Louisiana, correct, Bill? Shreveport. He always brings uh, students of his for like a Washington semester, and I'm going to let you introduce your, your cohort. Oh my gosh, I wasn't planning on doing this. Um, the, uh, my bodyguard this year is a six, a six foot, seven inch tall person, and I'll let him introduce himself. Oh, I'm Patrick Germany. I'm actually an accounting student, but I'm here with Dr. Peterson for the Washington semester, and thanks for having us here today. And then in case he's busy uh, fighting bad people, I got an assistant bodyguard. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Benjamin DeRose. I'm a student of Dr. Peterson's at Louisiana State University, Shreveport, and he just keeps dragging me to events like this. Happy to be here. <laughs> 
And we have one Thanks. brand new person here, and I'll let her introduce herself, because she was at one time a, a university uh, professor herself. Hi, I'm Lynn Whalen. I wish I was a student with Dr. Peterson, but I'm, I'm a guest of Tom Walter, and I'm very happy to be here. Thanks so much. Thank you. Now, we also ask at this time if there are Ju any new Judy members. Judy Hubbard has a guest. Oh. Yeah, I was going to introduce her next month, but I'll introduce her this month because she's my guest. I'd like to introduce uh, Charlotte Kroll. Charlotte, would you like to tell us a little bit about you? Because I think she's going to become a member very soon. <laughs> well, we don't want to interrupt Charlotte filling out her application. Well, I've now lived in the District of Columbia for more than 50 years, so it's quite exciting. Oh, I should bid it just closer. Okay. Um, so I've now lived in the District of Columbia for... 50 years, and maybe if I join, I can stop saying, well, you know, I'm originally from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> but, and people in Texas can quit asking me, when are you going to move home? <laughs> because I say I live at home. And I'm, I've lived in DuPont Circle for many years, right around the corner. I've been a member of the Women's De National Democratic Club, too, for a long time. And I've known Judy for practically most of the time I'm, I've lived in this in this city. Anyway, it's a wonderful place to live. I'm happy to join you. Anyone else before we turn it back over to Tom? Guest? Guest? Do we have any member candidates today? Uh, or new members who have, this is maybe their first time at a luncheon meeting. Okay. I'm Carol and Michelle, for those of you I haven't met. I'm the treasurer and membership chair. We have, uh, well, David Burns has already introduced himself, so he made my job er easy. <laughs> and uh, so I don't need to, I'll just re um, repeat that he's retired, descended from Washingtonians Morris Kessler, Yetta Kessler, Berg, and Bernard Berg, and he found out about AOI from the internet. Mm -hmm. And Judy Hubbard has been busy recruiting new members. So she, um, Clifteen Jones and Martha Kroll, who's filling her membership out right now, but Judy has paid, paid for the, her membership, uh, gifted the membership to um, Clifteen and Martha, so I figured we could vote on them now. And um, William McElrath, who just joined, he is a native Washingtonian, graduated from Archbishop Carroll, and, um, and is retired. So, welcome. All right, um, may I, I will now entertain a motion that these three candidates for membership in AOI of DC be approved by the members. Three, so moved, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Ayes appear to have it. Welcome, thank you for joining. Uh, now, um, we have our minutes from the last meeting. Uh, I, we can dispense with the reading of those minutes, but uh, that's up to uh, you. I'll entertain a motion for that, to that effect. Motion, so moved, seconded? Seconded. Seconded. All in favor of dispensing with the reading of the minutes from the previous meeting, aye. say aye. 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 Ayes appear to have it. <clears throat> and next, I will ask Carolyn to stand up again and give us our Treasurer's report. Oh. No, I don't get to eat, but <laughs> there's not much to report. So if the membership agrees, and since we're running late, I'll defer okay. my report. We will dispense with that for this meeting. Finally, um, under the category of milestones, I wanted to let people know that uh, Charles Sherfy Jones passed away on May 2nd. He was a native, uh, not a native Washingtonian, but he grew up in this city, graduate of Woodrow Wilson High School, later graduate of Duke, where he learned civil engineering and served in the U.S. Air Force, and then attended GW Law School, although he, uh, his first love was always insurance, and he was uh, in that business for many years, and he died, uh, as I say, on May 2nd, he leaves three children and eight grands. 
So we lose another member, but we gain three. So that's a pretty good deal. Secondly, just to, along the lines of, uh, for your information, I believe tomorrow, Saturday, May 22nd, from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., the National Capital Planning Association is holding an online, I guess you call it a charrette perhaps, or a colloquium on the recently unveiled Pennsylvania Avenue Vision Initiative. Um, the, three, uh, the three options that we've been offered at this point are urban capital, linear green, and civic stage. And this is something, uh, of course, that's always been of interest to AOI members, and I believe, I'm not, the, not the world's most uh, technically adept person, but you can access this on N NCPC, National Capital Planning Commission, ncpc.gov slash initiatives slash penna av, one word, slash vision. And it may be very interesting to hear what the detailed plans are and what uh, people may have to say about them. So if you're, uh, if you're interested tomorrow and you have a computer at home, tune in. So, and finally, I'd like to um, move to our distinguished speaker today, who is Mark Leibson. And uh, Mark holds a bachelor's degree from George Washington University after which time he served in the United States Army, including, including a year in Vietnam, for which we uh, thank and salute him for his service. Returning to Washington, he uh, earned an MA, Master's in History, from George Washington University. Now, for many years, he was a staff writer for Congressional Quarterly. And if any of you have ever worked on the Hill, as I have, Congressional Quarterly is the Bible. Uh, has always been a source of a great amount of information for us. He's also taught history at Lord Fairfax Community College in Virginia. And he, lives, he is uh, the author of nine books, including uh, Ballad of the Green Beret, which is kind of interesting because those of us who are of that generation remember uh, Barry Sadler's Ballad of the Green Beret. And this is, a, this is a biography of Barry Sadler, the man who sang the song, which was in the top ten for months and months when I was a boy. And he has also written biographies of... Uh, <clears throat> Francis Scott Key, uh, Marquis de Lafayette, and uh, is a senior writer now at the VVA Veteran uh, Newsletter. He's also contributed to the Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and many other publications. And today he's going to uh, he's going to uh, speak to us about uh, what's what's the title of the book? Desperate engagement. That's the story of a battle that very few people are familiar with and in which the fate of Washington, and in some, some respects one could say the fate of the Union, was decided at that time. So, without, as they say, without further ado, let me invite Mr. Leibson. You have better knees than I do. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks very much for that excellent introduction. Thanks for basically reading it the way I wrote it. Uh, <laughs> with, it's my pleasure to do a talk for you on this book that I wrote called Desperate Engagement. It, it's uh, a history of the Battle of Monocacy. Like we said, a little known but very important Civil War battle that took place on July 9th, 1864. And then the subsequent Confederate attack on Washington, D.C. The only time that the Confederates fought inside the nation's capital. Also not very well known. I'm sure you all know more about it than the average person. Um, and um, I just, before we start, I want, I want you to know that this, I've written nine books. I, I wrote one that I finished in <laughs> December 2019 and the pandemic has held it up so I'm going to claim that one as my 10th. So I've written 10 books and uh, but only one on the Civil War. I also taught U.S. History um, at Lord Fairfax 
in Warrington for eight years, and I taught the Civil War. But I don't claim to be a Civil War expert. However, I do know a lot about one specific part of the Civil War, and when it comes time for questions, I would respectfully ask that you just ask, <laughs> ask me about <laughs> that period. So next, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so I will answer any questions about the Civil War, or anything that happened between June 12th, 1864, and July 13th, 1864. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, and let me further clarify that. It would have to be north of Richmond, okay? <laughs> so I, I'll rule you out of order if you ask me about Appomattox or whatever. So next slide, please. What are we talking Well, before I get into it, I, this is something I used to tell my students, and it's something I think we should all keep in mind. I, I mean, I was in a war. Uh, there's nothing glorious or glamorous about being in a war, um, despite the fact that people try to glamorize it. So just keep in mind, war is the most horrible thing, among the most horrible things that human beings can do to another. Next slide, please. And you know, I used to show my kids this, this slide too, and a couple of others at Antietam, just to keep in mind that we're not just having a lot of fun here. We're talking about something deadly serious that had deadly serious consequences. Okay, enough of that. Next slide. Okay, so uh, let's just orient ourselves right now to um, this time period that I know so much about. Um, the spring of 1864. Um, this is takes place right after uh, the bloodiest six months in the Civil War. The last three gigantic battles called Grant's Wilderness Campaign, sometimes called the Overland Campaign. And this is when U.S. Grant unleashed unconditional surrender Grant, and we had tremendous carnage at three battles. You all know where Fredericksburg is, right? So if you go west, they were increasingly west from and ended up down in Richmond. So the first battle, uh, was the wilderness. Next slide, please. By the way, Cindy's already doing a great job. Thank you. We went over this. She said you can say next. Cough, nod your head. I'm, an, I'm a next slide kind of guy, so thank you. Um, Battle of the Wilderness, what a slaughter that was. I think you may know about it. Fought in the cornfields in May of 64. It was blazingly hot down there. Believe it or not, 61,000 Confederate troops took part. Um, 101,000. It was a slaughter. Um, we had 25,000 casualties killed, wounded, and taken prisoner. Next slide. This is a, a, a depiction of the battle. Next slide. The consequences. Next slide. You know, you can go there today. It's a national park. It's so beautiful. It always, it always makes you stop and think. So Grant was not finished. Lee retreated back toward Fredericksburg. Next slide. And then what do we have? The Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. Another slaughter. Um, over 30,000 casualties. Um, Grant versus Meade. Now, ag again, these were, quote, unquote, Union victories because Lee was... Uh, retreating, but the casualties mounted up like crazy for both sides. Next slide. We've heard of the bloody angle. Uh, it's a, this engagement that took place at Spotsylvania Courthouse. I won't even say anymore. Next slide. Again, if you go there, um, you know where it is. It's south of, of Fredericksburg. It's not far from 95. It's peaceful and beautiful. Next slide. Final large battle of the Civil War, the Battle of Cold Harbor. Um, this took place outside of Richmond. Again, uh, there were huge numbers of forces, not quite that many casualties, but still, you know, o o o over like 16,000 killed, wounded, and taken prisoner. Next slide. And it, and it went on for like 12 days. To orient you a little bit to where uh, Cold Harbor took place, because there are very, very, very few uh, remnants of what happened there today. It's sort of the suburbs of Richmond now. So if you're going to the beach and you're taking 95 and you take 64 over toward the beach, you're driving right through where Cold Harbor was. Can you see it on the map up there? See where Richmond is? Next slide. 
And I, I love those old Civil War maps. How they did it, I don't know. Uh, and I just love to show these images um, because they're, they're pretty cool, actually. Next slide. Okay, so Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, and Cold Harbor. Tens of thousands killed on both sides. But Grant succeeded in his strategic goal, which was what? To surround Robert E. Lee, who had retreated back to inside Richmond and Petersburg. So now he had Lee surrounded, and his plan was to wait him out and because of overwhelming superiority of Union everything, numbers of troops, manufacturing, <laughs> ammunition, materiel, he figured that he, it would work. So that's one thing to keep in mind of where we are. Second thing to keep in mind is we had a presidential election in 1864. I have searched. I don't believe that another country has had a democratic election during a full-scale civil war. And... Um, Lincoln was, there were no Gallup polls back then, but everybody knew that Lincoln was not popular. The Republican Party was divided. Again, the Peace Republicans and the War Republicans. The Democrats were divided, but they were united against Lincoln. And who did the Democrats choose to run against him? General McClellan, who Lincoln fired, remember, after the Battle of Antietam because he basically you know, didn't follow up. In fact, he just let Lee escape after this bloody victory. I mean, Antietam, the bloodiest day in U.S. history, 21,000 killed. Um, so uh, when I started the book, like I told you, I wasn't a Civil War expert, so I did my homework, and uh, I talked to a bunch of historians, and one of them told me, do not leave out the, 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 the election of 1864, because it has an important bearing about what happened throughout this whole story. So next slide, please. Um, this is not a good time for Lincoln or, or the North. Famously, he said, you know, he took, he would read those casualty reports every day, and he, you know he was a sensitive man, and he took them to heart. You can see the pictures of Lincoln, the photographs of him from before the war and after the war, and how much it just weighed on him. And he famously said, because of all the dead and wounded, the heavens are hung with black. That is not an actual picture of Lincoln. They hadn't invented color photography yet. So, <laughs> next slide. So, Lincoln didn't even think he was going to get the nomination. And remember, back then, the convention, the national political conventions actually chose the president. They didn't have primaries. They met in the smoke-filled rooms, and they hashed it out. And the candidates didn't go. Lincoln was in the White House, and he pretty much thought, like everybody else, that he wasn't going to get the nomination. And famously, he was in the telegraph room at the White House when the telegraph, that, that movie, Lincoln, that Steven Spielberg did, they show that scene. Um, uh, he gets the word that he has won the nomination. Next slide. And who did he choose for his vice president? Aha. Uh, I just lost my train of thought there. Well, no, Andrew Johnson. You know until a few years ago, the worst president in U.S. history. Uh, <laughs> but, um, sorry, no, no, I'm not, that, I meant George W. Bush. No, sorry. Um, totally, totally kidding. Not really. So, um, oh, erase, delete that when you, when you show this on the website. So, anyway, seriously, um, they chose Andrew Johnson, who is a Democrat, who is a Southern Democrat. He was a senator. He was against uh, secession very strongly, pro-slavery, of course. But Lincoln felt that he had to, uh, Republicans felt they had to get what we would call maybe a balanced ticket. Next slide. Just a little verisimilitudinous flag from the time period. It was, well, by the way, I wrote a book on the American flag, history of the flag, and it was not uncommon for uh, political campaigns up until probably uh, 1870 to, uh, you know, make up American flags, actual flags, not just posters with uh, campaign slogans on them. Next slide. Yeah. So what do you get? What do you get if you elect Lincoln? Draft and ruin. What do you get if you elect McClellan? Peace, big letters. Next slide. 
Okay, so now let's get into what's, what's going to happen here in a few, uh, in, in about a, a, a month. So Lee figures out what a grant is up to, right? He knows he's surrounded. He knows inevitably that um, he can't hold out because of supply issues, because of personnel issues, and so on. So he devises a bold uh, four-part plan to try to counter what Grant is doing. Number one, he wants to drive the Union forces out of the Shenandoah Valley, the breadbasket of the Confederacy. The train lines are blocked. The, the, the Union has the valley. They can't get food basically from there. So that's an important goal. Number two, he wants to free over, what did I say, 15,000 Confederate prisoners at Point Lookout uh, Prisoner War Camp. You all know where that is, right? The very tip, Southern Maryland. Not very far as the crow flies from where we are right now, right? It's really across, but, but to get there, you know, you've got to go all the way up and down. Um, that would represent an entire core of troops for the depleted Confederates. So that was a, that was a goal. Thirdly, um, or thirdly, and really most important in Lee's mind, was to force Grant, by doing all this military maneuvers, to take troops away from Richmond and Petersburg. And then the, the fourth plan was sort of like a, an addendum, and that's the actual word he used in the order. He wanted to threaten Washington, D.C., with the caveat that whoever commanded this, this group of troops uh, at, at his discretion could invade or fight or raid or whatever you want to call it. Next slide, please. Who did he choose for this uh, mission? Well, it's a blessing for historians to have colorful people to write about. And <laughs> Jubal Early was a colorful character. Um, you can just see his biography really quickly. Um, he's from Rocky Mount, Virginia, which is south central Virginia. Grew up in a prominent family. Went to West Point, not really for an education. I mean, sorry, not really to be an officer. It was to get a good education because it was academically strong as it, as it is now. He finished like fifth in the bottom of his class. Uh, he read law. He came back to Franklin County. He actually served a term as a, in the Virginia House of Delegates. And um, he was called up to fight um, in the uh, Mexican War. But when, uh, by the time he got out to Texas, the war was over. And then the same thing happened in the Seminole War. He got there, so he had no military experience when the Civil War started. Um, and he, uh, just to give you a little uh, character sketch of this guy, um, he was a complete racist, later became one of, the f one of the strongest proponents of the lost cause theory, which I think you know what that is. Um, he was a heavy drinker. He smoked cigars. He was known for his cussing and his high voice. He didn't get along with other officers. The men hated him. He didn't judge terrain well. Uh, he, didn't, he was not good at tactics. And, you know, the question is, why did Robert E. Lee choose them? And next slide, please. Um, and, you know, he, w he also contracted the bad kind of arthritis when he went out to, Mexico, uh, to Texas that time. And he was, so he was hunched. He was a big guy. He wore that slouch hat. He had that scruffy beard. He was hunched over. Lee called him my bad old man, even though Lee was older than early. The reason he chose early was because he didn't have any lieutenant generals left at the time. They were either occupied in the hospital, occupied elsewhere in the hospital. So he's the man that Lee chooses for this daring and important mission. Next slide, please. Just a little uh, marker down there in um, Franklin County. Next slide. That's a picture of him in old age. He did have one of the better beards uh, of, uh, of Civil War generals. And his post-war record was abysmal. I mean, basically, he burnished the legend. He never took the oath. He fled to Canada. Uh, no, he fled to Mexico. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> he went out to Texas because I think you may know that there were a bunch of them who didn't want to stop fighting. If Lee had not ordered it, it they, they might have gone on for years. But he finally said, put your guns down. So then Early went to Mexico, then to Canada, wrote one of the first 
uh, uh, memoirs of a Civil War general, then never took the oath, somehow got back to Virginia and spent the rest of his life in a hotel room in Lynchburg, <laughs> proselytizing for the Southern cause, the writing, speaking about the lost cause theory, and burnishing the legend of Robert E. Lee. Next slide, please. Okay, here we are to the part I know really a lot about. <laughs> so June 13th, 1864, uh, Lee puts out the order. Early gathers up his troops. In the early morning hours of June 13th, um, he marches about 8,000 men uh, from the Second Corps. Uh, they sneak out of the defenses of Richmond. I think you may know that Union intelligence was not the greatest during the, during the Civil War. In fact, it was abysmal. And this was one of their worst because they didn't realize that an entire core of troops, that met a decimated core, I mean, a core should be more than that, um, because, but 8,000 troops left, the, the, the left uh, Richmond until they crossed the Potomac on July 5th. So what do they do? Um, they, they get on rickety old trains, and um, tell me if I'm projecting enough. They go from Richmond to Charlottesville. They get off the trains, and they march to Lynchburg, arriving on June 17th. On June 18th is the Battle of Lynchburg. Who knows about the Battle of Lynchburg? Nobody, because when one, thank you very much. You want to tell us about it? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That, that, was there. That's correct. And what did he do? Excellent, thank you. Okay, what happened, what, thank you, that was excellent and 100% accurate. One of the worst, oh, by there were a lot of bad union generals, one of the worst, Dave Hunter, AKA Black Dave Hunter, he uh, was in charge, he took one look at Lee, uh, Lee, he took one look at Early's men and he fled. He fled over the mountain into West Virginia leaving goal number one fulfilled, kick the Union troops out of the Shenandoah Valley. And he was out of the war for, I don't know, a couple, three months. Um, yeah, so that, uh, that was the Battle of Lynchburg. Next slide, please. Not much battle. There he is. There's our man. He was known for doing something not very good that, that the Southerners didn't like, too. Next slide. And that is before this, um, Grant said, okay, the valley's yours, Do live off the population. So he took that literally and you know what they were doing, they were burning houses, confiscating crops, clothes, food, and everything. So he, and including, uh, next slide, they burned uh, or they tried to burn the Virginia Military Institute in um, Lexington. Next slide. This is that very inviting place today. Uh. <laughs> uh. Next slide. And of course, I think you know that Stonewall Jackson taught there and he's buried there. Um, next slide. Okay, so what happens is that, um, oh, early thought about going, go ahead. Well, didn't they also burn the governor's house? You know, maybe. Just Google it and we could talk about it later. <laughs> What, for our purposes, what we want to say next is that, I love this though, by the way, thank you. So, uh, what, what happened next was, Early thought about going after Hunter over the mountains, but they were the mountains. Then he remembered, you know, you, you want to threaten Washington, D.C., you want to you make sure the valley's clear of Union troops, because there were still more Union troops up there. Sorry, I, I, I spoke too soon. There were still more Union troops in the valley. So they headed what we call down the Shenandoah Valley, meaning more going north because the Shenandoah flows back or some reason like that anyway. They were going down the, the Shenandoah and they run into another dim bulb in the Union firmament. That would be General Franz Siegel. He was German. Uh, he had never had any battle, uh, war, wartime experience. Uh, he came over here and Lincoln hired him because why? They wanted to they wanted to get more German Americans and Germans to fight on the Union side. So he was like, he was a political general. And he's famous for uh, losing the Battle of Newmarket, right, in the Valley, uh, May 14th, is that right? I don't know, Google it, okay. And uh, 
Look, no notes. I'm just, it's all up here. So um, what happened in that one was, I think you may know that um, the, the Confederates were losing and they put the call out to the Corps of Cadets at VMI. And all of them marched up there in the mud and boys as young as 15 years old stemmed the tide and made uh, uh, a seagull uh, flee. By the, you know, do you know, um, uh, next, next slide. Oh, I know, I, I remember now. His nickname was the Flying Dutchman <laughs> for his propensity to flee from the battlefield. And you know, Dutch, Deutsch, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, okay, so, um, the, um, yeah, this is a little bit about the Confederate retreat. Um, we get, we're, so the, the, the um, Confederate troops are marching down the valley, going up north. They stop in Martinsburg and they raid the Union stores. It's now 4th of July. They had a big 4th of July party where they celebrated drinking a lot of Union booze and, and doing what rebels do. Um, they also, um, okay, so next slide, please. Yeah, there's my Flying Dutchman. So where did the Flying Dutchman wind up? At the Maryland Heights. That's Harper's Ferry. They're not, uh, you can't really see the Maryland Heights. I couldn't find it anyway. It, it's up there on the mountain somewhere. And, you know, good strategic position, actually. Very difficult. So Early and his men um, uh, come up to Harper's Ferry, cross, oh, well, they, they cross the Potomac at, um, what's that town up there with the college? <laughs> Shepherds, Shepherd, Shepherd's Town. They cross that Shepherd's Town. And um, he sees Siegel up there. But, you know, he's got the high ground. The Confederates, by the way, are tired. It was really hot. We're now July 4th. They've been on the march since June 13th. They had a, they had a serious supply problem. A third of them did not have shoes. Uh, they, they, you can read the diaries of these guys in letters about walking. They crossed the Potomac by foot and how they did it barefoot and their, rocks, their feet were cut on the rocks and so on. So he decides to take a little break and he makes a right turn and they camp right down near the Antietam battlefield. Next slide. Because this is two years later. So now let's talk about the defenses of Washington because that has everything to do with what we're talking about here. Here's another Civil War map drawn by, no wait, that's, that's from Google. So, um, but, uh, so I don't have to, uh, you know, educate you all on the situation and where, I have to a lot of times tell people not where Washington is but how it's shaped and what's what. So um, when the Civil War started, um, here you had the situation where Washington was across the river from Virginia. So you know that one of the first things the Union troops did was take northern Virginia, Alexandria, Fairfax, Arlington. Um, but it was still a constant worry with Richmond 90 miles away. So what was decided was to build a series of forts, which came to be known as the defenses of Washington. They circled the city, meaning going into northern Virginia, kind of like a beltway. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, these were defensive forts. They weren't, you know, huge, but they were uh, facing outward, sort of it usually in a horseshoe shape. Lots of artillery, um, and they were uh, so they were berms, you know, not even wooden structures, and they were basically connected by a series of berms and embankments circling us. I think there were how many were there? Sixty-eight. God bless. I remembered. Okay, there were 68 forts, um, and this is a schema of them. Next slide. Got some pictures of some of them. So um, we'll, you all know where we're talking about here. Fort Totten, next. Fort Gaines and Tenley. I think if you go up, uh, 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 there's that little patch of grass up there that used to be Fort Totten, Fort Gaines and Tenley Town. Yeah, next, please. So they were bristling with artillery for sure. Next slide. Next. We're, yeah, that's all that remains. That probably isn't even an original cannon, but you know. That's an original cannon. I knew that, I was testing. <laughs> Come on up here. <laughs> Next slide, please. 
And good old Fort Stevens, which we're going to talk about in a while, you all know where that is, right up uh, uh, Georgia Avenue. Next slide. This is a present day photo of the re, uh, recreated Fort Stevens. It's, uh, what is that, 13th Street yeah. on, on that side? Yeah. Apartment houses. Of course you would know the cross street. Yes, thank you. Next slide. <laughs> nice drone shot. Is that Rittenhouse on the top? Quackenbush, third alphabet. Okay, next slide. Hey, the only fort that's still there basically the way it was, is Fort Ward down in Alexandria. It is not the only fort that's still the way it was. It is reconstructed? The only fort that's reconstructed. <laughs> there are original parts, thank you. I love, I still, I love this, thank you, really. Just, just not anymore, so. <laughs> so. Uh, ne next slide. Here are, is Mary brushing her teeth? Yes. Okay. Mute the video. So, um, the <laughs> oh boy. Hold on a second. I've rarely had this much fun doing a talk, and I've done a lot of talks. <laughs> All right, so here's some reconstructed part of Fort Ward. Maybe that's the way it was. Next slide. Here we go. More Fort Ward stuff. Next. Okay, so you know where it is, the Fort Ward down near uh, Episcopal High School in Alexandria, right? Okay. Okay, so who was defending Washington in uh, this late in uh, 1864. Well, look, heavens were hung with black. Union forces, Grant had almost every able-bodied man down there around Richmond and Petersburg. Washington, you know this was a giant hospital at this point. Wounded, recuperating, Georgetown University, you name it, government buildings, they were turned into hospitals. So, guys that, um, recovered from their wounds but were not ready for battle, were put into something called the Veteran Reserve Corps. And the, the Veteran Reserve Corps originally had a different name, next slide, the Invalid Corps. <laughs> Changed for reasons obvious. So that's who is defending Washington, D.C. about, we think, we don't know exact. Look, the forts were designed to be defended by about 60 to 65,000 troops. We don't know, but we're, they were probably only about 10,000 invalids, a augmented by 100 days men. You all know what 100 days men were. These were guys mostly from Illinois, Iowa, Pennsylvania, who joined for 100 days and then would go home. Ohio. Whew. Okay. <laughs> and. Uh, None of, those, none of those individuals had seen uh, combat either. So we've got Jubal Early. Oh, by the way, they were augmented by cavalry. cavalry. So Early now has 12,000 troops, including cavalry. They're sitting at Antietam, Maryland, and they're heading toward DC, although intelligence was so bad, they hadn't picked it up yet. So next slide, please. Just a verisimilitudinous poster next, just to reinforce that Washington was one giant hospital at the time, next. Those are reenactors, next slide. Okay, so just to re recapitulate, um, personally to early uh, at Antietam. And then um, they decided, and also they had gotten a resupply of shoes. 
So Early gave the order and they started heading toward Washington, D.C. Next slide, please. Okay, so our next colorful character, another blessing for historians, is the Union General Lew Wallace, who really was quite a character. Uh, we like Lew Wallace. Okay. He, I'm, I'm getting there. Man, you guys are ahead of... It was the second best-selling novel of the 19th century, but that's later. Hold on one second. <laughs> Came from a prominent family there, Crawfordsville, Indiana. He, he had a good education. His father was a governor. But Lou didn't know what he wanted to do as a young man. He tried journalism, tried lawyering, and um, he uh, formed a local militia unit called a Zouave unit. Next slide. You all about Zouaves or Zouaves? For some reason, they used to like to dress up in these like Arabian costumes with pantaloons and, yeah. And, yeah, what did I say? Well, that's part of North, I'm sorry. North African, exactly right, Algeria. Okay, keep it up, I like this. Both sides had them, but the Union had more. Before the war, uh, Wallace commanded a unit and they were specialized in close order drill. And they would draw crowds like baseball crowd, 10,000 people to watch them do it. Uh, next slide. So then, they, they, here's some more Zouave pictures. They fought in those uniforms. Next slide. Go to Gettysburg Visitor Center, they have pictures of them. Okay. He wrote the second best, he went on to write the second best selling novel of the 19th century. He also was, uh, he was part of the, the um, court martial trial for John Wilkes Booth. He was um, ambassador to Turkey and governor of, of New Mexico. Just a few highlights of good old Lou. So next slide. Now, at this stage in the, so he, he joined, he distinguished himself in two small battles out there in Tennessee in the beginning, and that's when he got promoted to major general. Next slide. So he was one of the youngest Union generals. He also had one of the better goatees of, uh, one time I gave a talk and a woman came up to me, that's not a goatee, that's a Van Dyke. It's, I'm going with goatee, I'm a goatee guy. So, next slide. Um, then came Shiloh, so he was lauded, the Union Press played him up, but then came Shiloh where he, he got his men lost the first night, didn't, didn't make the battle, did arrive the second, I don't know how those guys found their way around any, any, anyway. Anyway, well, it probably wasn't his fault, fog of war and all that stuff, but he was, um, he, wa he was not who was in command. It was Grant and Halleck. Next slide. And, they, and he got on their bad list, uh, Henry Halleck, who later became the Union Army General in and Chief. And so they pushed Wallace out of the way. In fact, he went back to Crawfordsville for a little while. And then they did give him, he was itching to get back in the war. So next slide. They gave him a job but not a very good one. He was the commander of the um, Middle Atlantic Department um, based in Baltimore, very far from the action. Now Baltimore, I think you know, was a hotbed of Confederate sympathy. There was a little stuff going on, but he hated it and he was itching to get back in the war. So next slide. Um, so I told you Union intelligence was terrible. The word, the word is getting uh, to Washington where the, they have the wrong commander, they don't even know it's early. They start, the, the, the telegram starts saying he's got 30, 40, more than 40,000 troops coming. And yet no, nothing happens. Wallace sees the same and he decides on his own, remember he's still on the outs with Grant and Halleck, and on his own, without orders, um, he gets uh, a brigade of men and they get on trains uh, in Baltimore, and they go to, out to Monocacy Junction to try to block uh, Early. Pretty gutsy thing when you think about it, because guess who he had? He had nothing. He had, uh, next, next slide, I think I have it here. Um, oh, we, got, we got that, okay, yeah, next slide. Okay, anyway, he had like, well, I don't know what, um, uh, 1,500 men, most of them were 100 days men, he had one um, uh, artillery unit. Um, the Confederates wound up having, like, he had, he had six guns. They had six artillery battalions. Um, anyway, he arrives at Monocacy Junction, which you know where that is, four miles south of Frederick. 
Back then, it was a thriving junction. This is a picture of it today. And um, uh, next slide to orient you a little bit more. Um, a famous thing happened near there earlier in the war, the famous Lee's Lost Order, where they found two, two privates found the Lee's Order of Battle for Antietam, and they turned it over to McClellan, and they did nothing. And right across the street from Monoxy Battlefield, there's this historic marker, which is about where that happened. Next slide, please. So Grant is down there at City Point, and he's figured out by now what's happening. And he's, he's, he says no. And it's in, it's in the letters. It's in the diaries. They're, 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 you know, his, his aides are going, <coughs> General Grant, you know, they're, they're, they're heading toward D.C. And he, do, he just refuses to act. Next slide. Um, finally, he does relent. And he sends the six core troops, 5,000 of them, uh, up to uh, Monocacy. These are battle-hardened guys who fought through all of the wilderness campaign. And um, next slide, please. And um, here's another Civil War map. Um, no, a Google map, I'm sorry. So uh, there they are down at um, Richmond and Petersburg. They get on ships, they go down to James, they come up the Chesapeake, they go all the way up to Baltimore, they get on trains at Camden Station, and they get to Monocacy Junction. The morning of July 9th. Next slide. There's a picture of the Monoxy National Battlefield today. Next slide. So th you don't have to read this, and I want you to, but I just, it just, th this is to illustrate how outgunned, even with the six corps men, 6,500 troops now, he's facing early. This is the order of battle for the Unions. Next slide. This is the Confederates. You know, they got one, two, three four divisions. They got some great commanders. Next slide. John Brown Gordon, you know, all, all the battles in the, in the Eastern Theater, shot five times in, at Antietam, once right through the cheek. That's why he posed this way for the camera. He came back and to, to the war. Next slide. Tiger John McCausland, John C. Breckinridge, former Vice President of the United States from Kentucky. Next slide. Two Virginia guys, Ramser and Rhodes, neither of whom survived the war. Next slide. Um, so, first shots were fired uh, July 9th, 1864, and you know, some people call this a skirmish. It, you know, it was, it was a battle. I mean, I know the rivers ran red with blood is something you hear about a lot, but you know, they had the river right in the middle of the battlefield. There were three bridges over the river. Fighting went back and forth. With four. Now, I, I, next slide, please. Um, there's, a, there's a little scheme of it. You know, the, the, the thing for it today, luckily we do have the battlefield. Development has come within 100 yards of the northern part of it, and luckily Chuck Mathias, Senator Mathias, shepherded a bill that gave us, that saved the place. So we have the battlefield, all the important things. However, Interstate 270 goes right through it. So it's, it's kind of difficult to picture it when you're there. You gotta go in your car at least twice, because um, stuff happened on both sides of it. Um, 355 goes right through it, you know, Urbana Pike, a.k.a. Rockville Pike, Georgia, w w Wisconsin Avenue. So there you go for that. Next. Um, yeah, so Early wasn't even on the field of battle when it started. He was in the city of Frederick extorting $200,000 from the city fathers. Uh, next slide. Okay, so just very quickly, if you go, you go to Monoxy, you go to the best farm, which has been restored and the Worthington House, and there's great um, uh, primary source material about the family that lived in the Worthington House. I forget their name. Oh, Worthington. Yeah, the Worthingtons, including a little boy then who became, the, oh, anyway, he, they, were, they were peering out of the windows because there was, there was a, a dismounted cavalry fight right between them. It was the, and the Union, the Six Corps troops cut them up. The Monocacy, not today, but then was filled with wheat fields and um, corn fields. And, the, the fighting was rough, and, it, and the, the Confederates took a lot of casualties. Next slide, please. There's one of the bridges, doesn't exist anymore. Next slide. The railroad bridge, Union troops retreated over that bridge. It doesn't even have a base, you know, it's just railroad tracks and ties. Can you imagine being fired at running over those ties? Next slide. So like I said, three battalion artillery versus six pieces of artillery. 
when Wallace, fin Wallace held out, but he finally ordered a retreat, 4.30 in the afternoon. We had about 1,300 Union casualties. Didn't ever made the official records, but we think it was about 800 Confederates killed and wounded. It was blazingly hot. Everybody who's written about it who took part of it mentions, nobody mentions the temperature, but you know what the temperature would be around here then, probably 90s and 90% humidity. And the Confederates had been on the march for, for a month with those woolen uniforms. Un unbelievable to me. So, um, next slide. Okay, so um, when word got out that Wallace was defeated at Monocacy, he was relieved of his command. He was later reinstated, and he went back to Baltimore. Uh, Early, who was this aggressive general, in this case, because of the heat, because of going through what they did, he had the troops spend the night on the battlefield, taking care of themselves, uh, taking care of the Union prisoners. Um, he sent his cavalry north to Baltimore for two reasons. One, as a feint, so that Washington wouldn't know that was his next target, and secondly, to cut the uh, railroad lines and the telegraph lines, which they did. So Washington was basically incommunicado the next day. Um, there was panic in the streets of Washington, D.C. when they heard that early and they didn't God know how many tens of thousands of troops were now, what, 40 miles away and maybe headed for the city. So uh, the rebels are upon us is a famous quote from Gideon Wells. And you know, um, the the, the, the president's staff put a ship in, 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 on the Potomac, provisioned with supplies to get Lincoln out of town. Um, he didn't know about it, and he was furious when he found out and didn't have to, but that shows you what was happening. Next slide, please. So the word went out to go and help our 100 days men and invalids at the forts. So, you know, I did a talk at the GPO because they knew that GPO employees went to their houses and got their guns and went out there, as did hundreds of people from the State Department. I mean, the word motley was used to describe who was defending our nation's capital at this, at this juncture in the war. What a sorry lot they were. Next slide. So, getting to the end here. So what, what would have been the consequences of attack on Washington, D.C.? Think about it. Think about thousands of Confederate troops running wild in the city. Now, these are what ifs, right? Historians don't like what ifs, but, you know, it was on people's minds. They could have raided the treasuries. They did take supplies all the way along as they were headed toward Washington and, and uh, in Maryland. Uh, they could have burned the city, and then, in a, in a bigger sense, it could have had an impact on the election. Remember, Lincoln, everybody knew he had an uphill fight, um, and you know, think about the headlines. Now, did they have Twitter back then? No, wait. That, think about, but they had newspapers. If the word got out that Lincoln had to flee Washington and Washington was in flames, who knows what would have happened? Um, you know, it didn't happen, and things changed very drastically after September 1st, you know this, with uh, Sherman taking Atlanta and Sheridan in, 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 the, in, the, in the valley and so on. But this was, on, this was a very, a very crucial moment in the, in the history of the Civil War. Next slide. We talked about that. Oh, then Grant sends the rest of the Sixth Corps up from Richmond because he realizes the seriousness of it. Um, they arrived down at the old docks on 7th Street they got out, the citizens greeted them with ice cream and sandwiches. We've been saved. And then they headed up Wisconsin Avenue the wrong way, and they turned around and went up 7th Street Pike, Georgia Avenue, to, to get to Fort Stevens. Next slide. And so again, you know, they, he got them, got them on ships outside Richmond. They went down the James, up the Chesapeake, but this time they came to the Potomac and came into Washington. Next slide. Um, yeah, so on uh, July 11th, the Confederates reached the outskirts of Fort Stevens. Jubal Early could see the Capitol Dome from his glass sitting on top of his horse. The Confederate's probably most aggressive general. And what did he do? Well, he did not order a full attack. Why? Remember, these guys, had, they, they, his, his, his troops, they weren't decimated, but they were strung out. But, so they had, 
they had left uh, Monocacy and they came down um, 355. There was skirmishing in Rockville um, and there, the Union had sent a couple of cavalry to harass them. They, they were tired, it was hot, so his troops were basically strung out all along uh, 355. So he didn't have the troops. Um, and then, um, so he, he, did, he did have his artillery. So there was artillery exchanges and skirmishing on July 11th and July 12th. The night of July 11th, the, um, Early took his generals out for a council of war at um, Blair, Blair House, the Blair Mansion, not Blair House, but the Blair's House in Silver Spring. Next slide. Um, there's the Blair's, you know them. Um, they conveniently got out of town at the time. Breckenridge knew where it was, he was vice president, so they decided what they would do and they decided that they would decide again on the morning of July 12th whether to attack or not. Next slide. So on July 12th, um, Early gets back to the barricades at Stevens and he sees the six Corps guys there, right? They had this, a distinguished white uh, cross or red or whatever it was. And now he knows he can't attack because this, the place is very well defended, or not full bore attack. But they did have more skirmishing and they did have artillery going back and forth. Next slide. And I think you know what happened. That man came out to see the citizens of Washington. Now, you know, this was in the border of Washington, D.C., but back then Washington was down here. That was the farms out there. So the citizens of Washington came out to see what the hubbub was about, including the number one citizen. <laughs> there he is. Is that an original photo? Uh, that's a re no, sorry. That's a reenactment. Re There's no photos. However, next slide. That's right, I meant to say, there is one famous photo. <laughs> there is? Why don't I have it? Send it to me. There he is. That's not a photo, no. So you know what happened, right? He was on the parapet all six, five with a tall hat and a Confederate sharpshooter in the trees at the old Walter Reed, like how, what, 100 yards away, 200 yards away, shoots and wounds a Union uh, doctor right next to Lincoln at which point Lincoln was asked if he would please get off the parapet. <laughs> and you know, there's this legend, next slide. Yeah, there's a legend that Oliver Wendell Holmes, he was there, he was a Union lieutenant, but there are also a lot of other people there, said to Lincoln, get down you fool. Well, someone wrote a book about it and dug deep enough to see that it was, he, first of all, it was unlikely that he did it and he, he didn't, somebody, but somebody did say something. Plus, the story didn't come out until 1936, so you know what that means. It, it's apocryphal, but it's a great story. Next slide. Okay, so the fighting goes on, and the morning of January, July 13th, uh, the Union troops wake up, and the Confederates have vanished. They retrace their steps. They went back up through Montgomery County into Poolsville, and they crossed the Potomac on July 13th, which is actually the end of my story and what I know about the Civil War. However, uh, let me just finish by saying, you know, people call this a raid or, a, you know, there were 300 Union casualties, dead, or dead and wounded. We don't know how many Confederates that never made the, e, the OR. And by the way, you know where Grace Church is on George Avenue near the Beltway? There was an unmarked Confederate grave there until about, what, two years ago? and it was moved, and there's a Black Lives Matter sign there. I just love looking at that every time I go by. God bless the Grace Church people. Anyway, um, and there's a little tiny cemetery. It's supposed to be the smallest national cemetery right off Georgia Avenue. Yes. I said supposed to be the smallest. I knew that. I didn't know that. Yeah. I knew that too, but, you know, got to get it. It's, it's an a, a national cemetery, right? I think. Did you? Yeah. Ah, the monument of great, that was at Grace Church, that point, an appropriate place for it. Yeah, okay, so uh, n next slide. I have an old picture, actually, of, what do we call that place again? I call it Fort Stevens, no. What's the cemetery's real name? I'll change that, Battleground National Cemetery. That's kind of what it looks like, although Georgia is paved, right? So, coming, coming up, coming up. Wait, wait, wait. 
two minutes, one, 90 seconds. All right, next slide, please. Oh, by the way, so they crossed the Potomac at White's Ferry. That's the former ferry boat. You heard all about that business? Yeah, okay. And it was named after Early because of that, because that's where they crossed back. Next slide. Maybe. Yeah, I knew that. Yep. All right, what ifs? Historians don't like what ifs because they didn't happen. But, you know, this is some serious stuff here. Um, you know, should Early have invaded? Could he have invaded? Did, you know, they, bill, they, they bill the battle. Monocacy is the battle that saved Washington, D.C. Um, and did, what effect did it have on the president? Okay, so next slide. Oh, well, just stay on that one. Sorry, back one quick. So what effect did it have on the election? You know, Lincoln won in 64, but not by a lot. I mean, the, the, he won, you can see the, the, the electoral college and so on. Um, should Early have invaded? You know, it, it's been debated. You better give Carl that tag, too. Attack. I'm coming out. Your knee, your knee should cut this. Oh, that's oh, no. Anyway, sorry. All right, ne next slide. I'll, I'll just wrap it up. I got two more slides. Sorry. Somebody said I had an hour. Okay, so next slide. Okay, last thing I'll leave you with. So remember that main goal of Grant was to force. Uh, of Lee was his force troops away from uh, Richmond and Petersburg. Here's the stats. June 30th, 137,000. July 9th, 93. August 69. Now, not all of them left because of going up to fight. A lot of them enlistments went up. But really, think about it. This, it worked, right? I mean, uh, Grant's, pl uh, Grant's plan to end the war worked, but not until March of 65. Um, who knows what would have happened if he hadn't sent troops away, and a lot of those Union troops had stayed there. It, the war could have ended, we don't know, months earlier. Just food for thought. It didn't happen. Last slide. If there's one thing, next slide, I want you to take away from this whole thing is that Jubal Early was one day. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you very, no, 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 stay, don't oh, go away. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for uh, coming today, and I didn't mean, you know, to stop, I don't even have my watch. I was kidding. Look at my watch, I was okay. Kidding. If I hadn't had but, all those, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> I um, want to thank you for coming today, and I would like to present you with a certificate of appreciation from the Association of Oldest Inhabitants. And with that, including my mask, <clears throat> is the uh, coveted so oldest Association of Oldest Inhabitants of the District of Columbia Challenge Coin. So if you're a Challenge Coin collector. I may have a few. Good. Thank so you. add that to your collection. And don't go away, because we will have some questions. And if you want to ask a question, the microphone will come to you. Please stand, tell us who you are, and state your question. I think they asked them all during the talk. <laughs> I'll, I'll be sticking around a little while to sign books. So if anybody has anything, I'll be happy to any happy to help. Any questions? Yes. Uh, Loretta. Loretta. Here we go. Uh oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Is is this on? Hi, I'm Loretta Newman. Um, I'm the founder and past president of the Alliance to Preserve the Civil War Defenses of Washington, and I've given similar talks myself. I enjoyed this thoroughly, and sorry, I hope you didn't mind our... I loved take. it, actually, really. <laughs> I thought you did an excellent job, and I wanted to thank you. Um, but it really is important, and, and I just wanted... I handed out some flyers. I don't know if everybody got one, but the annual commemoration of the Battle of Fort Stevens this year will be on January 16th. It's always on... Did I say January? Oh, my turn to... 
It's July. Yeah, Jerry, Cole. Uh, June, uh, July, I'm sorry, July 16th. Uh, Monocacy will be the week before on the 9th. That's when the battle there. So we, we kind of coordinate with them when we have it on, on a Saturday that's the closest. The Battle of Fort Stevens being uh, the 11th and 12th of July. But it's really an important and, and interesting and entertaining event. Um, I'm a past president of Neighbors of, of the Alliance. I'm a past president of several organizations, but the Alliance to Preserve the Civil War Defenses of Washington. And our current president, Gary Thompson, portrays uh, the, the general at Monocacy. And you'll see him with his beard and everything. So you have to come and see that. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank sure. you very much. Any other questions? And I, I would just, before I take the mic to Pat, I'd also say that Loretta and her group were instrumental in finally getting the Park Service to establish the Circle Fort Parks as its own superintendent ship, right? Because otherwise they, they traversed like three different jurisdictions in the Park Service and they'd never do anything. The Park Service would never, you know, they went that away, you know, no signs. And now in the last eight or so years, they've gotten nice signs up at all the parks, standard signs that say, Circle Fort Parks law, isn't that right? Yeah. Test. I have to clarify, as you know. Um, actually, we unfortunately still don't have a superintendency because you actually have to be designated as a park. Um, that we are still a unit of the Park Service, but we are not. The Fort Circle Parks is not its own unit. It's part of the of the forts in D.C., I mean the parks in D.C. There is legislation, however, introduced in Congress to create the Civil War Defenses of Washington um, National Historical Park, and that would give us a superintendent. What we did get is a program manager who oversees the forts, and we did not have that before we had the Alliance. <clears throat> it's been a huge help because there was no staffing. It's still very little staffing, but it's so much better than it was. This isn't really about the, uh, the war, but that slide you showed with the Zouaves, or those couple of slides, took me back to my childhood. I grew up in Michigan, and whenever there was a, I don't know, a presentation or something that we were gathered, you know, in a gymnasium or something, the Zouaves would perform. And they were in those, whatever you called them, North, North African costumes. I had no idea what they were, but they were very red, you know, step and gun, you know, fake guns, and they, I think their final act was always to climb over a wall on top of, like, each other or something, but I'd never, I've never heard of them since then, so. Did you ever tell us what the best-selling novel that uh, Lou Wallace wrote was? Oh, everybody, one, two, three. Ben Hur. Oh, the best-selling? Right, sorry. One person's, <laughs> Uncle Tom's Cabin, sorry. Yeah. Uncle Tom's Cabin was the number one best-selling novel of the 19th century. Ben-Hur was number two. Hi, my name is Bonnie McCabe, and I'm vice president here at the club. Welcome to all of you. Um, any of you who are history, that was wonderful, by the way, and I haven't laughed so much in a long time, so thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Loretta. <laughs> I just wanted to um, allow you history buffs to have another kind of adventure in DuPont Circle, the Educational Foundation here has developed a walking tour of DuPont Circle. This is the brochure. And we'd like to invite you on Wednesday mornings. You can call and, and let Pat Fitzgerald know that you're coming. And you'll have a guided tour of women's organizations around DuPont Circle. Some of them have been, as we will be in November, here for 100 years in this neighborhood. So as a native Washingtonian born at Garfield Hospital, lived on Church Street many years, um, I welcome you all to come and take the, take the walk. Thank you. Other questions? Other questions? One other thing I'd like to add for Mark's edification, and a lot of people may not know, is that AOI inherited a map of the Civil War forts of Washington. And I've forgotten the E.A.E.C. Johnson, I don't remember the name, and it's the one that had red dots around where the Civil War forts were all placed. And prior to the forts being placed on the map and published that way, it was just like a tourist map. So they reprinted it and 
it was the only map, and I think I've got this right, at least this is the way we heard it at the auction, that the U.S. government confiscated all the copies of the map as well as the printing plates because they gave away the location of the Circle Fort Parks. So there were a number that slipped through their fingers. AOI was given one by one of our members, which for a long time we just sort of took, oh, it's just a map, whatever, and we had it appraised, and a couple of appraisers said, oh, it's worth maybe a couple thousand dollars for insurance purposes and all that. We decided and went to auction at, um, over in uh, Falls Church, and in like 30 seconds, it sold for $12,000. And um, the only other I mean, the copies locally are at the Historical Society. I believe the Kiplingers had a copy. And um, oh, who's George Washington University? Who's the collection there? Albert Small has one. So you know, it's very rare, but it's kind of interesting that one of those Civil War maps, not by Google, but one of the original ones what was for a while in AOI's possession, and AOI benefited from it being our gift. Too. Thank you. Uh, now, before we adjourn, last but not least, uh, our distinguished historian, Nelson Ryman Snyder, will uh, give his uh, quiz. Okay, the trivia question, this is an easy one, I think, I hope, but the rule is if you've, if you've won a trivia question in the last three years, you're not eligible. We want to give it to somebody who hasn't won, okay? <laughs> oh, yes, okay, raise, raise your hand so we can get a, a, a thing on this. Uh, what agency in 1865 was charged with protecting the president? No, that's, that's not right. That eventually they did. They might have been, if they had been at the time, Lincoln might have been saved. <laughs> this is, don't think federal agency. Think local agency. Okay. <laughs> That's right. You got it. That's right. <clears throat> now. The answer is that the Metropolitan Police Department of Washington, D.C. was responsible for providing personal protection to the president. Now, the uh, officer assigned to Lincoln when he went to uh, Ford's Theater was John Parker. He had gone on the force when it was established in 1861, and he had a very poor record. He had been cited many times for drinking on duty, sleeping on duty. This is the man who's going to protect the president. Had been. And uh, the night uh, he reported for duty, a shift was 4 o'clock to midnight. He reported to the White House uh, to escort the president to uh, the theater. The uh, storekeeper asked him if he was armed. He wanted to see and check. He wanted to say, show me your arm. Is it loaded? Are you ready? There's a lot of rumors out there that the president could be in danger. And so he was forewarned. Got to the theater, checked out the box, and uh, it was reported that uh, his assignment was, of course, to be at, at the door leading into the president's box. Well, he left that this, uh, area and was seen in the theater watching the uh, play later on. And then he disappeared from the theater altogether, apparently. In the meantime, we know what happened. John Willex Booth came in, shot the president. <clears throat> well, Parker was charged. He was cited. And a board was convened to hear his case. The charge was 
on this particular day, the said Parker was detained to attend and protect the president, Mr. Lincoln, that while the president was at Ford's Theater on the night of the 14th of April last, said Parker allowed a man to enter the president's private box and shoot the president. <clears throat> Four days later, he appeared before the board. A transcript has not survived that we know of, at least not in the National Archives. Now, I'm hoping that maybe there are a lot of records of the uh, Metropolitan Police in this trove that will be transferred to the DC archives. Maybe we'll find out there. But apparently he was not uh, disciplined in any major way. He served three more years on the force. In 1868 was finally dismissed after a long series of, of uh, infractions that continued throughout his career. Uh, this is the man who could have saved the president. What happened to him? We don't know. Disappeared into the mists of history. Will we ever find out? Has anyone here found out? <laughs> because maybe we, uh, it's been an obsession with mine. I've, I've checked city directories to try and find it up there. I haven't been able to, and I have some other sources to look after. But <clears throat> I have some copies of the citation uh, if you'd like to see it. Uh, signed by uh, A.G. Richards, who was the superintendent at that time of the police. But he was charged. So that's uh, my trivia question. And I have a, uh, who won? Right here. You get, you get, you get the prize. <laughs> Thank you, Nelson. As always, that was an interesting one. Uh, I want to remind everybody that Mark is, uh, has his book on offer uh, here in uh, the clubhouse. So stop by and uh, pick up a copy before you leave. Our next meeting, which is May, June. June date, please. Bill knows. June 15th, 16th. Uh, and we will uh, have a presentation on the DC, is it? The DC Recorder of Deeds Office, which is designed by Nathan Wyeth, no relation to the famous Wyeth, or very distant relation to the famous Wyeth family. And in closing, I would like to simply say thank you all for coming. This was a record turnout for our new, wonderful new venue at the Women's National Democratic Club. And I want, I want to say to our members who are not here today, we wish you would come and join us. We miss you. We have a wonderful venue. We have great programs. And so in the future, I hope we'll have turnouts as big as this or, or even larger. And I have one, one comment. How many people were online? How many were today? 21 people online. Oh, 21 online, and we had 52 for lunch today? 56. And Bill Rice, too. Yeah, Bill is here, too. So thank you all for coming. I will now entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Second? Second? All in favor? Aye. I declare this meeting adjourned.